BBC Radio 4, the news at 8 o'clock. NATO warplanes have begun attacking Serbian targets after President Milosevic refused to accept the international peace plan for Kosovo. Explosions have been heard around the provincial capital Pristina and outside the Serb capital Belgrade. American officials say that warships and B-52 bombers have fired cruise missiles at Serb air defence targets, including missile batteries, radars and military communication sites. RAF aircraft are also involved in the raids. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, has said he's shocked by the attacks. But speaking at the White House, President Clinton said the airstrikes were the last resort after President Milosevic had not only rejected the peace deal, but stepped up his repression of the Kosovo people. His forces have intensified their attacks, burning down Kosovar Albanian villages and murdering civilians. As I speak, more Serb forces are moving into Kosovo and more people are fleeing their homes. 60,000 in just the last five weeks. A quarter of a million altogether. Tony Blair, who's in Berlin for the European summit, refused to discuss how long the strikes would last. He said that NATO was united in its determination to end the repression in Kosovo and warned Serbia against trying to retaliate. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr George Carey, has said the use of force would always be a matter for regret and that his thoughts and prayers are with everyone caught up in the conflict. In other news, the law lords say the Home Secretary Jack Straw will have to reconsider General Pinochet's extradition case. It follows their ruling that the former Chilean dictator can be sent to Madrid. But in a six-to-one decision, the law lords said he should face only a very limited number of charges. The Speaker of the House of Commons, Betty Boothroyd, has said that in future all ministers and MPs who receive leaked reports from select committees should return them without delay. The issue was considered after a Foreign Affairs Committee report was passed to the government. BBC Radio 4 News. And we'll be keeping you informed of the situation in Yugoslavia as it develops. The next scheduled news bulletin is at nine o'clock. Now it's two minutes past eight and time for the Moral Maze. Here's Michael Burke. Good evening. Well, as you've just been hearing, it started. An hour ago, waves of cruise missiles striking targets in Serbia and Kosovo. The moral justification from Tony Blair in the last few minutes. Justice, he said. That's all those poor people driven from their homes in Kosovo are seeking. We have the means to help them secure that justice and a duty to see that justice is done. Once again, diplomacy has failed, peaceful pressure has failed, threats have failed. Once again, the West, led by America and Britain, sees no alternative but to bomb what it regards as a malevolent and intractable dictatorship back into line. The immediate issue is Kosovo, a province nominally a part of Orthodox Christian Serbia, but whose population is 90% Muslim ethnic Albanian. It's a vicious, dirty little war, even by Balkan standards, with unspeakable brutality on both sides. But the Serbs are the ones held responsible for causing most of the misery who are seen as evil oppressors. Their argument that Kosovo is part of their emotional, if not demographic, heartland, the place where the Slavic Serbs fought and died to stop the westward spread of Islam doesn't carry much weight beside the present-day television reality of 430,000 people made homeless, 2,000 dead and tanks shelling defenceless villages. The argument for airstrikes is that they're the only way to avert a humanitarian disaster in Kosovo, to stop the war spreading through the Balkans and to defend NATO's credibility by keeping faith with Kosovo's civilians. But basically, it is that there is no alternative left. The argument against is that aerial bombardment is the bluntest of instruments with unforeseeable consequences for the combatants and those who get in the way, that it is evil in and of itself and doesn't fall within the moral and theological category of a just war. Why Milosevic and Serbia when we've let so many tin pot autocrats get away with it? What happens if airstrikes uh, alone fail to bring him to heel? Bombing the Serbs, is it right or is it wrong? Our moral maze live this evening. Our regular panel, Janet Daly of The Telegraph, Professor Ian Hargreaves, the journalist and academic, the constitutional historian, Dr David Starkey, and Dr David Cook, the medical ethicist from Oxford. Ian Hargreaves. Well, a moral maze is certainly the right place to discuss Balkan politics, where nothing is simple and moral cul-de-sacs are everywhere. The political argument about Kosovo, the theft of its pre-1989 autonomy by the Yugoslav government, suggests to me that the Kosovan Albanians deserve support on those grounds alone, but I don't think that that would justify the NATO onslaught. 
No, the issue that justifies the bombs and the risk of British lives is the genocidal, one doesn't use that word lightly, regime of Slobodan Milosevic, which helped massacre Muslims in Bosnia and is now doing so directly in Kosovo. If Europe and the values we fought for in 1939 mean anything to us, it must mean that we stand against such outrages. We can only hope the bombs find their true target and help bring down this murderous regime. Janet Daly. I very largely agree. I think the moral case for intervening in Kosovo is at least as strong as was the case for declaring war on Germany when it invaded Poland in 1939. And then, too, supposedly enlightened people said, what does this have to do with us? Why risk getting into a war in which we have no immediate national interest? But unfortunately, our present leader is no Winston Churchill. This generation of political leadership in the United States and in Britain is clearly terrified of the electoral consequences of taking real risks. So they insist they can fight a surgical war with no casualties on our side and few civilian casualties on the other by dithering at the outset and then announcing self-cancelling limitations on their belated action, they may have created the worst possible circumstances for achieving anything. David Sarki. I find the new statesman guardian gung-ho tendency joining hands with the rant of the Telegraph morally and politically distasteful. What is going on at the moment is worse than a crime, it is an error. We're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time for the wrong reasons, with almost certainly the wrong outcome. David Cook. Well, I believe that we are our brother and sister's keeper, but I'm always frightened when we pick which brother and which sister. Mr Blair's correct, of course, it's our duty to see justice done, but which justice and for whom? If we're really concerned about the vulnerable, well, let's be consistent in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda, in Sudan. If the aim's just peace, I understand bombing into submission, but I don't understand bombing into cooperation. If we're going to sow a missile attack, I hope we're not going to reap a whirlwind. Uh, panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Dr. Rana Kabani, who's uh, a writer and broadcaster on Islamic affairs. Um, Dr. Kabani, it may well be that uh, British pilots will be uh, putting their lives at risk over Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, as we're speaking, are we morally right to put them in that position? Are we morally right to be using the full force of NATO against what is a sovereign state? I don't answer yes lightly. I'm someone who's lived through war, who's hidden basements with children, and I know what the punishments of war are for everyone. But I think we are. Unfortunately, I think this is coming way too late. We're, we're um, eight years down the line of um, genocide, and I don't use that word lightly either. But the eradication of Muslims, um, which has been Milosevic's plan, a plan that was deliberate and coldly uh, organized, where he started targeting, before he started killing people, he started targeting libraries, museums, mosques, in order to eradicate all signs of a multi-religious society that was the former Yugoslavia. It was me, after that. Let me stop, stop it was your after treatise that. in mid, mid, mid flow there. No, it's not a treatise because. Let no, me finish. I, I understand you. I wasn't being. Uh, uh, no, a let flippant. me finish. I, I meant well, to uh, finish much, by uh, making a point, okay. which is this that there is a deliberate campaign to um, make Serbia only a Serbian country, which is impossible because apart from the Muslims, there are ethnic Albanians, Hungarians, Czechs, etc. I understand. Dave Starkey. Let's not get for the moment onto the question of multi-ethnicity. I think it would be interesting to ask the question, say, about Pakistan, um, and turn to the issue in hand. Many people are making a comparison between the bombing which we are launching now um, on Milosevic and the bombing we launched last autumn on Saddam. Presumably, for all the reasons you're indicating now, you were a strong supporter of the bombing of Saddam. It's not the same thing at all. Um, it, this is a campaign of genocide that we have witnessed. I was supporting... Kurds? Uh, Marsh Arabs? That was uh, completely different because at the time that Desert Fox was launched, it was a campaign to supposedly um, implement the findings of um, a discredited UN uh, organization at the time. But we're not talking about Iraq now. We're talking about... Um, right, well, let me, do, forgive me, let's just then ask the follow-up question to that. Okay, we did the wrong thing then. Um, but may I ask you about means? We bombed Saddam. Did it work? Uh, did the regime of Saddam fall? Did he change his policies? 
Well, the uh, Saddam regime is weakened, certainly. Really? As is the Iraqi people who have been starved now for about eight years by very punitive sanctions. But we know from 1992, with the emergence of the concentration camp of Omar... Omar Sorry, I'm asking you, do you think that bombing is... I'm sorry, you seem very difficult to understand questions, find it very difficult to understand questions. I find it very difficult to to listen to this harangue of yours. We're talking about a very serious genocide that's happening, and there are... It is my people. The largest, involved. the largest, there is the largest religious community in Europe is Muslim, and they're all watching to see how their co-religionists are treated. Well, sorry. Uh, okay, then. Are we then just including two million British Muslims, with well, which I am one? Can we just try and ask, get some sensible answers? Do you think, on the evidence of what happened in Iraq last autumn, that bombing brings dictators down? Bombing does bring dictators down, depending on how it is handled. And also, can you really accept that a petty Hitler like Milosevic is colluded with for years and years and years, as NATO and the UN have colluded with him, by suppressing the the accounts of concentration camps as they did in 1992, by colluding with genocide, by allowing genocide to go unpunished, breaking the conventions of Geneva by doing so, which calls for the punishment of those Do you think, do you think that the hands of the KLA are clean? You heard, uh, you heard Michael at the beginning say that there have been atrocities on both sides. Why do you have to produce this utterly one-sided partisan rant? It's not when at all no, no, one-sided David, or partisan rant, I'm sorry. It, the whole world is now in agreement that this man is a murderer, a killer, a mutilator. David, I think you've gone. Qu- David, I think you've gone quite no, enough. I asked David, I think KLA. you've gone quite far I've enough now. I got no answer. I just I think, got the usual. I think the, the audience will be able storm. to make up its own I mind. David Cook, can, can I ask you whether or not this action is designed to punish? Milosevic, or whether it has a particular end goal, and what is the goal and the aim then? I hope the end goal is to destabilize him and to put him out of power. I hope that not only for the Muslims who are suffering, but also for the Serbs who have lived under an incredibly repressive regime now for a long time, who have, those who have not colluded with him, have been themselves tortured, murdered, imprisoned. Why do you think that bombing uh, Serbia and creating a kind of nationalist wave, uh, a war situation where people often pull together, is going to achieve that destabilization. Well, what will achieve it? Diplomacy hasn't worked. He's been lionized again and again as the person who will bring peace to, to Bosnia and now to Kosovo. The London conference under John Major shockingly colluded with him <coughs> and, and uh, allowed him endless diplomatic wriggling out of, of, of well, I think uh, that's going a, possible a, solutions. A, 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 a bit far, but Janet Daly? Well, I don't think there's any doubt now about uh, your claim that, that, that he's a Hitler-like figure. I think there's no doubt in anybody's mind in the West. But I, I'm a bit worried about... You seem to be implying that there's something peculiarly anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim in the Western complacency about this. I mean, the Croatians were Catholics, and we didn't do much to help them either. I, you know, to turn this into a kind of race war seems to me to be a bit... Dangerous, I'm not turning it into race war. It's Milosevic who's turned it into a religious crusade. Yes, if but you against listen, everybody. If against you, everybody. Well, against particularly Catholics, against, against Muslims. Muslims. In fact, Karajdik um, uh, went on record in 1991 as saying that the Muslims were unarmed and therefore the easiest group to, to exterminate. And so this was a policy that was pursued from the very beginning, yeah. from the time when there was the famous march on Kosovo led by Milosevic. Ian Hargreaves? I would have thought that the uh, answer to David Starkey's question is that uh, bombs had something to do with the fall of Hitler and the fall of oh, General Galtieri. Did, 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 they, did they not? Infantile. I'm sure they did, and I'm very sorry that Hitler wasn't stopped earlier, as I'm sorry that Milosevic wasn't stopped earlier, because we would have had a quarter of a million people not displaced as a result of him having been propped up, and um, the, the tens of thousands of people we've seen killed would not have died. But are the Kosovars without fault here? I mean, are there links to drugs? Are there abuses that they also have done? I mean, is it all as one-sided as black and white? No, it's not at all black and white. But Kosovo is a um, province that has uh, 90% Albanians in it. They do not want to live under Serbian repression. Uh, Out of the 8% Albanians who form 
the population of the former Yugoslavia, Amnesty International has found that 75% of prisoners of conscience are Albanians. So they have gone through real privations and oppressions under this regime. Dr. Rana Kabani, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Our next witness is Dr. Spiros Economides, who's a lecturer in international relations and European politics at the LSE and specialises in, in, in Balkan affairs. Uh, I don't think many people would argue that Mr. Milosevic is, a, is an evil man and what he's been doing in Kosovo is evil. Um, if there is no other apparent and obvious way to stop him, aren't airstrikes, however regrettable, the right thing to do? Well, if airstrikes are intended to put an end to the repression within Kosovo, the day-to-day -day, uh, putting down of uh, civilians, the day-to-day -day, uh, aggression against unarmed uh, non-combatants and villages, this is not the way to do it. I think this is very much a case of saving the credibility of a Western alliance which has painted itself into a corner and has to take some kind of dramatic action to get out of it. Well, I'm bound to ask you what, uh, what other course of action would be more effective. Well, ultimately, the answer is we should have done this a lot uh, sooner. Yeah, but um, we are where we are. We, we are where we are. Well, then you carry on down the path that's been mapped out ahead of us and insert those ground troops much sooner than expected. If you actually want to reach some kind of either peace or stability in that part of Serbia, which is known as Kosovo, you go in on the ground and create a kind of situation a la Bosnia, which I don't think very many people within the West actually want to see. But there are around 40,000 Serbian troops in or around Kosovo. Well, uh, again, it the airstrikes... It would take a rather large army to... to indeed, indeed. That's the, price, them, that's the price that may have to be paid for trying to carry out such an intervention. The airstrikes are not actually going to be targeting those very troops in the initial phases. They're going to be targeting Serbia proper to try and, to use the military jargon, degrade assets. Ian Hargreaves. But isn't it uh, perfectly logical to think that um, following the destruction or degrading of those assets, if... Uh, some sort of action on the ground uh, is then um, uh, happens that there's more chance of it succeeding. There is that chance, but the degrading of the assets we're looking at tonight are assets that can be used against the, mili the, the airborne hardware which the West is deploying against Serbia and not necessarily against the potential insertion of ground troops into the area. So phase one of this operation is, in a sense, uh, a defense of the credibility of the threat presented by the West from the air and not paving the way necessarily for the insertion of ground troops uh, at the weekend or next week. No, uh, clearly not at the weekend uh, or next week. But it's not clear to me whether you are opposed on some sort of grounds of principle to bombing and to airstrikes or whether you are merely arguing that the timing and the tactical follow-through uh, is not sufficiently clear. I think I agree on both of those counts. I'm not sure what these airstrikes are attempting to achieve with respect to the situation on the ground. I argue very much that it has something to do with the credibility of the West, which has really forced itself into a corner. But you are in favour of the West taking action to resist um, the um, actions that the Milosevic government has taken against the people of Kosovo. Is that your position? I'd like to insert, uh, inject a bit of greyness into this discussion by saying it's not such a black and white issue. Here we are dealing with a sovereign, independent state that is carrying out uh, uh, some policies which we find morally objectionable. But, but, but how, uh, how do we go about dealing with them? But is it sufficiently grey that you say there should be action or there should be no action? Diplomacy, which we would have all preferred to have seen succeed, has failed. That cannot be denied, can it? Well, it can't be denied to the extent that we've set our own time frame for when we want this diplomacy to succeed, and now our, our bluff has been called. So, but, but, so what is your position, that we should act or not act militarily? My position is that if we are going to act militarily, we should go much further down the line than what we're doing now. Uh, uh, what's the moral uh, equation in all this, uh, do you think? Uh, I mean, if we are trying to achieve a military result without, uh, without significant casualties, is that a rather weak moral stand, in your view? Well, it's, it's not a weak moral stand with respect to our own service people who may be uh, there, but it's a weak moral stance with respect to the people on the ground. Are we actually doing enough? If we consider this to be an act of genocide, well, then we should do something much more serious about it in the short term. Janet Daly. Um, you mentioned this being the sort of abrogation of a sovereign state. Um, 
Kosovo was had independent in the old Yugoslav Federation. Kosovo had independent status. So in a sense, had, you could it say autonomy. Autonomy. It, did have, it, did have, it did not have, have independent it status. It had autonomy within the federation. And now what Serbia is doing is transgressing that previous autonomy. That so autonomy was rescinded quite a while ago. That autonomy has been granted and taken back quite but quite I, often. But what I'm saying is, are you suggesting that Serbia should have a right, as it were, to assume the sovereignty that was implicit in the old Yugoslav borders and should have a right to say we own everything, we have stake a claim to everything that was the previous Yugoslavia and we're reasserting that sovereignty over all those... Yugoslavia is the successor state to the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia which has been dismembered ah, in the last seven years. that's precisely what's at issue, isn't it? Exactly, but So you're, still... you're aligning yourself with the Serbian position then? No, you're I'm saying that you accept the political and moral force of the Serbian argument? No, what I'm saying is that there is an issue here of international law which makes it much more difficult to actually give legitimacy to an action which is an act of war, and we don't want to call it yeah. that. An act but, of war against a sovereign, independent state yes. that we've been dealing with kind of over a number of years. Uh, hang on a second, Janet. David Cook. Uh, I'm just interested. I've just returned from the States, and it was quite clear that most people didn't know where Kosovo was. And there are many people in Britain who are not very clear. So why are we concerned about genocide there and not genocide in other parts of the world? Well, the usual line that's trotted out is that this is in Europe, and it's much closer to home uh, for the British position and of course uh, our main allies are the Americans and they wish to, to ensure that uh, the European arena, the European theatre is one which they have some control over and they represent the interests of their various allies. But at the same time, I think your point is absolutely right. This could be an arbitrary decision. It's chosen at random almost to do something here and not do something in Rwanda or elsewhere. David Starkey? If we actually look at what you were suggesting, in other words, another Bosnia being imposed, that really involves the imposition of a kind of new imperialism or moral colonialism doesn't it? It's the creation of another protectorate. I mean, that's in fact what we've got in Bosnia today. We've got a nominal state which is divided into two and run administratively, economically, politically, militarily by various agents With of, huge the so -called, uh, of the so-called international community. Is that justice? We've been taught, haven't we, since the uh, Tony Blair's phrase, we've been taught since the end of the Second World War that there was a thing called self-determination, that colonialism was a bad thing. We're turning these people into a kind of moral colony. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's a form of justice. It may be the first step down the line to justice. It's certainly a cessation of hostility. It's peace in the very narrow sense, but it's certainly not justice. Ian Hargreaves, last question. Well, it, it, it's peace with some justice, I would say, but that's the point I want to try to clinch with you is that you say that stronger action would be right if this were genocide. Do you agree that it is? Is this a sufficient outrage against the values which we all believe we share for action to be taken? I don't still know your position on that. I think action should be taken because it is a big enough violation of certain moral standards that we hold. My point though is that action is not necessarily being taken for that particular reason. Thank Dr. You. Economides, thank you very much indeed. Our next witness is um, uh, Professor Adrian Hastings, who's the author of SOS Bosnia. He's also a trustee of the Bosnian Institute. He's on a, a line now from Leeds. Um, uh, Professor Hastings, is, is this in theological terms a, a just war, in your view? Yes, I think it is. Why? Uh, because it meets the, all the conditions of a just war, very clearly, and that, I think, is not the case in regard to our bombing of Iraq. It was not the case, in my view, at least at the time, in regard to the Falklands War, and I wrote an article to say so, but I think it certainly does. The aim is justified, the likelihood of success is adequate, the, if, if one does not act, there is likely to be even more damage and disaster than if one does act and alternative means have been pursued for a long while. And so I think it meets, it meets the four conditions, for traditional conditions for a just war very well indeed. David Cook, your witness. It's interesting, though, that you didn't mention the one about the justified authority and whether or not this is really a sovereign role that the Americans and NATO can properly play in relation to Bosnia and Serbia. Yes, I think there is uh, backing internationally for this. Now, I would far prefer if the United Nations could do it, but it's been perfectly clear through the whole of the Bosnian War that the United Nations was incapable of doing it. Therefore, the question is, 
uh, so morally, the British nobody, and the Americans no can set themselves it. up. It is you. It is NATO. It is the uh, as large a group as possible of, practically speaking, of neighbours of Serbia and Kosovo, who the Americans uh, are hardly acted. neighbours, are they? No, it isn't. It isn't primarily the Americans. It's primarily you. Well, may I ask then if the, what is the aim? You said there's a just aim here. What the, is that aim? Is it to punish aim, or is it to set no, up? No, it is not to punish. It is to ensure a reasonably just, reasonably autonomous condition for Kosovo. And how and will that, that I do think that? How will it do that by bombing? We will do it because, I think in two ways. One, actually, the destruction of military equipment in and around Kosovo will make it extremely difficult and probably, possibly impossible for the present destructive campaign of a Serbian army to continue. I think the other way it will do it is that I suspect that Serbia as a whole, and very probably President Milosevic too, will quickly decide that it is actually better to make peace and to agree to something like the terms which were offered in Paris. Another feature of the just war is the effect on non-combatants and of course also the rate of casualties. How does that actually play in the uh, equation? Clearly, that's got to be balanced against all the people who are being killed if there isn't one. I don't think that the number of non-combatants need necessarily killed in this campaign need necessarily be very great. Uh, exactly the same was said in Bosnia for four years to argue that we couldn't do any, we couldn't intervene uh, by bombing in Bosnia. In fact, when we finally did, that was a very significant development in bringing about a rapid end to the war. And it would have happened three years before if we had done it three years before. Janet Daly? Oh, sorry, I just wanted to intervene on David Cook's point about America not being very close. Um, NATO now has a new member, it's Hungary, which borders on this directly, yes. on this situation. And um, if NATO is to mean anything at all, then it has to mean defending the interests of those countries that are all, all those countries that are members of it, doesn't it? Yes, I'm, I agree entirely. I think it means uh, ensuring that the whole of Europe is run in a reasonably peaceful and civilized manner. Now, in fact, today, Serbia is, I think, the only country in Europe where that is quite manifestly not the case. Uh, uh, and, and is ensuring that run is, uh, Europe is run in a, in a peaceful and civilized manner uh, ensured by raining bombs on... on well, I think in this case, I'm afraid, yes, I think it is when everything else you, has you, been attempted. You'll admit there's an element of paradox there. There is indeed an element of paradox, but I think that is the case, that the only way Sometimes you can protect the innocent who are being m murdered is by being violent to the people who are murdering them. David Starkey. I have to say, coming from a Quaker background, though long abandoned, that I find theologians acting as armchair strategists fairly distasteful. However, um, can we go to... I the happen to be a historian as well, an Oxford historian. Uh, well, uh, I, oh, I, shan't, I shan't press you on these petty rivalries, but as you're an Oxford historian, perhaps you will tell me, do you really think that the Balkans are part of Europe? Yes, I do, very much. And I've been in the Balkans quite enough, long enough, to know that they are. And, so the and Balkans... I know plenty of so many Balkans people who are extremely civilised, just as civilised as you or me. But isn't it also true, Professor Hastings, you're clearly getting quite unnecessarily cross with these innocent well, well, questions. You are upsetting isn't it, people tonight, Isn't David? it true that the Balkans is essentially a country of empires rather than quasi-sovereign states? Yugoslavia was an empire, wasn't it? No, I don't think it was an empire, though it was becoming one. It was a federal, at its best, it was a federal state, and it's a great pity it couldn't continue in that way. It was become, there was always an element of being a Serbian empire. Of course, it was greater Serbia, past, it, it, it was becoming. But, but then, are you really wanting to revive, you said there weren't empires, you're wanting to revive empires in the Balkans, aren't you? We, no. heard, from, we heard from a real expert, somebody who didn't have to boast of where he got his degrees, from Dr. Economides, that in fact, in Bosnia, um, there, there, what, there is now a United Nations empire, a protectorate. You're wanting another piece of moral colonialism, aren't you? Well, maybe temporarily, that is the best thing. Uh, and I don't only, see temp only temporarily, Professor yes. Hastings. Will you, exactly will, like will, you will you tell me how you can see a way out of that? 
how in the tradition and history about the, of the Balkans about which you know so much, there is a tradition of that m willingness of communities to sit down beside each other and to forget their histories. Yes, uh, in, fact, in fact, if you go to Sarajevo or if you go to uh, Kosovo for that matter, you will find that they have been doing so. It isn't actually true that all Kosovan Albanians are Muslims, but a great many are Catholics, but which is often forgotten, and they live quite well happily together, as they, as Muslims and Catholics they and did Orthodox, on the and David, I think, I think live Hastings. together in David, Sarajevo. David, I think we've, we've heard quite enough from you. Uh, <laughs> Professor Hastings, uh, thank you for putting up with him, uh, and thank you for uh, giving your evidence tonight. Our last witness is Simon Jenkins, former editor of the Times, columnist, commentator, all that, um, and, and adamantly opposed to to intervention uh, uh, and airstrikes in, in Kosovo. Is, is your position basically a utilitarian one or a moral one, Simon? I think it's basically a utilitarian one, because I can't see any point in morality that doesn't have a utilitarian outcome. Oh, wow. Well, that, that would take <laughs> us on to uh, onto an entirely broader brace. Janet yes. Daly. Um. <clears throat> You said this week in your column, um, why of the current civil wars and humanitarian horrors is it Kosovo that now summons British troops? Is there any humanitarian horror that you think would be worthy of intervention? I would have thought if we were... Uh, yes is the answer. Um, I can think of many in history. Um, I would have thought that there were plenty at the moment uh, that might be worthy of it. Uh, Indonesia is one. Uh, Congo is another. Um, I would have said far more horrendous inhumanity by man against man has been committed in those countries than at least was being committed when we began to intervene in Kosovo. Now that's interesting because you just said that you were more interested, at least in the, in the immediate term, in utilitarian arguments mm -hmm. than in, in moral ones and yet you've just given me a, a, a very sort of straightforwardly moral argument for why we should intervene somewhere where we don't have any particular utilitarian interest as opposed ah. to Bosnia where the, which, whose notorious instability could, could actually be very dangerous for Europe. Well, I'm not totally persuaded by the last point, and it's, it's usually produced by people who, for some reason, want to intervene. But anyway, uh, I, I was being asked about morality. Um, I, the, what I meant by utility was, I can't see any point in intervening, by which we mean going to war. Let's not mince words. I can't see any point in going to war against people if you aren't going to win something. Um, I'd be very sceptical of winning in Indonesia and very, very sceptical of winning in Congo. I can't see how we're going to win in Kosovo either. So you don't think it would be worthwhile to intervene just in a case when you were protecting innocent people from being, from genocide or from persecution? Most, most people are innocent. Um, uh, yes, if we could. Uh, I have to repeat, I can't see how we're going to do it here. So, you, uh, so you're not only opposed to bombing, you're opposed to any sort of military intervention. You just think we should walk away? I would have said, if uh, absolutely independent of anything that we were doing, to uh, the internal politics of Yugoslavia, in which we've been a major player now for five, six, seven years. Um, if we were, if there was what might be called genocide occurring in Yugoslavia, and we decided we were going to stop it, which we have not decided. If we had decided we were going to stop it, then I think I can conceive of a situation in which I'd support it. And what would that consist of? What would, it was what would it was, stopping it consist cons of? It would consist of invading, uh, seizing political and policing control of the country, and deciding we were going to police it forever, as in Bosnia. Uh, so you... Sorry, so go on, Janet. One last question. You, wouldn't, you, you don't mind, then, in principle, what David calls sort of UN empire building. You don't mind the idea of us having a permanent presence whereby we police an area in order to protect one group against another that's I, persecuted. I, 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 uh, I do mind, because I actually believe in the old UN Charter. I think other things being equal, the world is made up of all sorts of states, many of which are extremely unattractive, for instance, China, uh, which we nonetheless have dealings with. But uh, if we are going to do it, and uh, I think there was a case in Lebanon at one point for doing it, um, then we have to accept that one of the consequences of that is going to be a UN colony, as it is in Lebanon. The, just just no. one, one wee, more utilitarian point. David was allowed a to, very keep, to carry one, on please, in spite David. of interruption, so I will. Um, the the utilitarian the point, the oh, Greece... The, this, the danger of this situation spilling into Greece and Turkey and Macedonia and Hungary is a real utilitarian danger, don't well, it you wasn't, think? It, well, all I can say is it wasn't spilling over until we got involved. Um, I mean, it is extraordinary to me. There's so much mealy mouth talk about this. When, when, before we got involved, he was an extremely unpleasant dictator whose writ ruled within his own country. Um, there are plenty of those around the world with whom we have perfectly normal dealings. It was only when we started giving, frankly, encouragement in this case to the KLA, a pretty unattractive group of people, that they started committing atrocities against which the Serbs have committed even greater ones. We are parties to that dispute. 
Ian Harvey. Uh, aren't you guilty in the way that you're putting this argument of turning it into another form of black and white? Uh, because you don't know um, what is going to be effective in terms of military strategy. You can write columns and speculate, as any of us can write columns and speculate. But isn't it reasonable in principle to say that, it's, that we should set the risk that we take in a particular approach, military approach or whatever, against the severity of the problem that we are dealing with. So one has to match those two things against each I, other. I totally agree. I just think that you... I cannot conceive how you could establish that matching in this case. Um, if... I mean, I think the obligation has to... or the bonus of proof has to be on the bomber not on the non-bomber. Um, all the evidence is, no one's ever produced a case except the highly uh, dubious case of Bosnia, where bombing has had any effect at all other than strengthening the, the regime bombed. Uh, it, we have the extremely specific case of Iraq, where it has not achieved anything that it was supposed to achieve. Not only that, but in this case, we have statements by the Prime Minister which give no answer to the question of what you do as the follow-up. Now, if you can't follow up a fairly simple question like what you do after the bomb has fallen, I'm very sceptical about your motives in dropping the bomb. Well, let, let me ask you a follow-up question to your position, which is this. Um, starting from where we are now, what is your position if the um, Milosevic regime unle unleashes a truly awesome, murderous campaign in Kosovo and kills thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Do we do nothing? Uh, I mean, if, th if that were to be the case, uh, and if n none of that blood was on my hands for having encouraged the um, incidents to which it is a retaliation, I would agree. Let's go to war with him. But let's go to war with him. Let's not have this gesture politics of dropping bombs. The bombs are but, irrelevant. But isn't it at least possible that by sending this signal in this way, we increase the likelihood that we have the willpower to do what I agree we would have to do in order to settle the problem in those I circumstances? If you, think, if you think that dropping bombs increases your likelihood of putting in ground troops, I would probably go some way with you, but I don't think that for one minute. It's an alternative. But David, can I just explore... Um, I don't think it's utility you're really talking about. I think it's pragmatism. Uh, and I'm wondering, might be the if, right if, word. if pragmatically this was shown to work, will you then say, I was wrong? If, as a result of tonight's bombing raids, the uh, Milosevic went on television tomorrow and said, I'm frightfully sorry, I made a terrible mistake, uh, I'm de I've decided to grant autonomy to, um, to, to the people of Kosovo. Um, oh, and by the way, you can march in your 10,000 troops. I have to say, I would admit I was wrong. Right. Now, can you then just clarify? It's what the It's what the Prime Minister yeah, said no. yeah, should but, happen after the bomb. But what's important is, uh, what would count as satisfying either utility or pragmatism? What, what's going to be the test by which we're going to judge it? Is it freedom for Kosovo? Is it an end to genocide or what? No, uh, the, the stated objective of this military action, which is quite severe, I mean, as, as one of your previous guests said, this is, this is an act of war against a sovereign state in Europe. It's not something you just do lightly, like, like bomb a medicine factory in, in Sudan. Um, the, the, the test has to be that you've achieved the objective you set out. The objective you set out is partial autonomy for Kosovo. I think it is absolutely fantastic to think you're going to achieve that by bombing. Yeah. Janet, a last question. Just, let, let's just ignore the, the sort of asinine things that the political leaders are saying. The, the reality of... of um, let's just ignore everything. No, no, no. Um, David, shut up. <laughs> the, um, you seem to be shifting your ground, Simon. On the one hand, you're saying you disapprove of any kind of military intervention because you think it's all our fault anyway. But on the other hand, you're criticising bombing specifically and saying that it would be all right if we had an effective military intervention. So which is it? Well, w I, I think in these circumstances, I'm broadly speaking against military intervention. I think we should leave these people to sort out their own problems. Um, as a result of the intervention that began, uh, we have seen a, a swift escalation of the situation on the ground. If it reaches the point that Ian mentions where such horrors are being done, uh, as a result of the, um, the, the sort of paranoid entrenchment of this awful man in his position, uh, that, um, that we simply have to say this has got to stop. It's 100,000 troops in Macedonia, tomorrow, invasion. But you'd approve of that? I would have said, I, approve is the wrong word, but yes, I'd support it, right. because that's the only way of achieving the goal. But at the moment, uh, I don't think that is the case, and I, 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 I strongly feel that, that, if I may say so, your argument earlier on in this saga was precisely the, the, the creep 
that got us to where we are now. Uh, it was the case before we intervened that he was not murdering people in Kosovo. He started murdering people in Kosovo when we encouraged the KLA to, to well, he was violent resistance. In, he was murdering people in Bosnia. That's right. He was we, busy somewhere else. And at else. least we there went in. Simon mm. Jenkins, thanks very much indeed. Uh, OK, uh, panel, let's gather a few of these threads, threads together. David Cook, did you hear anything um, uh, that would morally justify intervening uh, in this uh, violent way? Well, in, in this case, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, pick any one from half a dozen, Sierra Leone, say. Yes, I think, uh, as Simon Jenkins has said, I think that Indonesia and Congo and other parts of the world are as worthy of our response in terms of genocide. I think that, uh, while I'm not a pragmatist, I do think that this question about what are we trying to achieve, and I'm not quite sure what this is, whether we're trying to achieve punishment or whether we're trying to achieve a just and lasting peace and justice for everyone. And just Justice for everyone isn't going to set up an independent Kosovo, because then what about the Hungarian community that we heard about? What about the Catholic community there? So we're not going to set up a Muslim state. Uh, Ian Hargreaves, are you convinced by uh, Dr. Uh, Rani Kabana? Uh, I, th I thought Dr. Kabani uh, gave a good account of her argument against oh, she certainly made a severe powerful case against provocation. Yes. But I'd, I'd yes. like to take up this, the, this argument uh, of David's and, and Simon Jenkins about uh, how far away the problem is. It seems to me that if you uh, always wish to introduce that argument, that's like saying um, uh, there's no point in dealing with uh, a problem of injustice and hunger in Birmingham because we can't deal with problems of inju in injustice and hunger in Dar es Salaam. It's about consistency. It's not about how no. distance. Well, it, but, it, but we have to, it, the moral principle uh, may be the same, is the same in both cases, but the issue of moral effectiveness and of practical effectiveness, which of course this discussion uh, quite properly turns around, it is not only a moral issue, those who wish to argue a moral position about it, as I do, do have to deal with the argument of whether it will be can, effective. Can we then take David the Starkey? question of effectiveness? Um, what we saw very clearly, none of our witnesses, with the exception of our theologian, was able to say confidently that there was any kind of tradition of multi-ethnicity any serious tradition of multi-ethnicity. We've got to face the very straightforward fact that we will be imposing a protectorate if we are successful. And that has no long-term desirable outcome, whatever. The second thing, the second thing, and it seems to me to be really crucial, we have now irretrievably set Russia against the West in the Balkans. Anybody who knows anything about the history of the 20th century knows that that is disastrous. By setting Russia openly against us, we have made it certain that the conflict will spread, certain that there will be Russian help. Anybody who so knows your Balkans position throughout the Cold War, David, was that we should be uh, go on being very kind to the Russians, was it? Because we didn't want to be... Uh, no. Uh, if you Russians. hadn't noticed that the Berlin has Wall has fallen, than I have. If you exactly. haven't, if you haven't noted, no. But the, the trouble is, the, 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 the cold, the cold war David, is if, over. Just one second, and then David, I will if, completely uh, shut up. The cold war is over. Yes. We are, Michael. Do for once try and treat I'm a serious. The only person you haven't seriously. abused tonight, David. So you make it around uh, total. No, I have um, Janet Daly. Uh, the idea that Russia, in its present impoverished Ruritanian state, is going to be any kind of threat. They are uh, more economically dependent on the West than they have ever been. So the idea that they're going to be some serious threat seems to me risable. They're going to make a lot of noise, but I don't think that we have anything to worry about in terms of actually setting off a world war with them at this May point. May you not have but to live to on, eat all those right, words. All right, fine. Shut up, David. This business of what are we going to do next after bombing is a legitimate enough question because this, this whole thing has been so cack-handed and badly conceived. But at the same time, I think it's absurd to think that every war in the past has been planned from beginning to end. When you invade a country, even if you invade with all flags flying, all singing, all dancing, troops on the ground, you still don't know what the next step will be. You still don't know what all the contingencies are. It's inevitable when you start a war that you set off a series of concatenation of circumstances that you can't predict. Right, but if you're going to argue, as Hastings did want, to argue that this is a just war, then you have to have a very clear aim, because otherwise, how are you going to know that you're going to achieve it? And in your view, David Cook, a just war, very briefly? Uh, I think that evil has to be restrained, and how we manage to restrain evil uh, will involve sometimes res using power and using force. I'm not clear that this actual restraint is going to be successful, either for Milosevic himself and his group, nor for the Kosovo's. That's it for this week. From our panel, Janet Daly, David Starkey, Ian Hargreaves, David Cook, and from me, sorry about the snuffles, I always get a stinking cold after Red Nose Day. Fickle finger of fate, poking fun. The gods are not mocked. Until next week, goodbye. 
The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs. Now, with a look ahead to an extended edition of The World Tonight, here's Roger Hearing. Tonight, NATO has finally backed its diplomacy with force. The long-threatened onslaught against the Serbs has begun, and Europe is facing one of its most serious crises since the end of the Second World War. On The World Tonight, we'll be examining the high-risk strategy on which NATO has embarked and looking at the effectiveness and morality of aerial bombardment as an instrument of international policy. That's with me, Roger Hearing, on The World Tonight at 10 o'clock on BBC Radio 4. And that extended edition of The World Tonight means that tonight's book at bedtime can be heard at the later time of half past midnight.